dismissed uh, all of our Little Sprouts to go to Little Sprouts class today to the book of Luke, chapter number 18. The book of Luke, chapter 18, and then also the book of Matthew, chapter 18. I want to turn to two different passages of Scripture this morning, Luke, chapter 18, and Matthew, chapter number 18. Preach from a little bit different angle today, talking about the fact that Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children. All of you are aware, many of you were made aware, uh, just this past uh, week, uh, the tragedy that happened uh, in our nation uh, from what uh, occurred in Connecticut. How many of you saw the news of what happened in Connecticut? The terrible tragedy of 20 different children uh, being gunned down into school classes, six different teachers sacrificing their lives for the sake of the children. Amen. An incredible tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. How did you feel when you saw all that was going on in the news? What type of range of emotions were you experiencing when you saw the pictures of the police officers carrying the bodies of those little children out of the schoolhouse? What was the range of the emotions that you felt? Did you feel sad? Did you feel grieved? Did you feel angry? Did you feel overwhelmed with grief? for those families and that tragedy this year. About the only way that we could even surmise that tragedy from the Scripture and place it within the Scripture during the Christmas season of time would be Herod's slaughter of the children. Many of you remember that when Herod's spies found out that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of Ephrata, Herod sent out a decree throughout all of Bethlehem, Ephrata, and Jerusalem to kill every male child uh, up to the age of three years old. That's why the book of Isaiah gives the great prophecy of there would be great weeping in Bethlehem of Ephrata as Herod's soldiers went out and slaughtered children. Some people say that that was somewhere around 1,200 male children, male boys that were killed and slaughtered by Herod's troops when his spies found out that the Christ child would be born in that area, that part of the country. And they said weeping would go on. Can I tell you, church family, weeping is happening in America. It's happening in America. While we are saying and looking at each other, Daryl, and saying, have a Merry Christmas. Have a Merry Christmas. Have a good holiday season. Have a wonderful time with your family. You know, I found myself in several different places yesterday as I was running some errands in and about the city, and I noticed something about the city of West Plains that I've never seen before. Typically in West Plains, parents yell at their children. When you go into Walmart, you'll see a parent yelling at their child. When you go into a restaurant in, in West Plains, you'll see a parent hit their child or strike their child or yell at their child. This is commonplace in our city. But yesterday was a different day in our city. Yesterday was a different day in our city. As I walked into a local restaurant, I saw kids with their parents, unusual amount of kids. I saw parents hugging their kids. I saw parents being more affectionate with their kids, loving on their children. Do you know, church family, our kids are a gift from God. Amen? They're a gift from God. They may be stinkers and ornery every now and then, but they're a gift from God. Amen? Meant to be loved, meant to be held, meant to be taken care of. I, I saw parents listening intently to the stories of their children yesterday. I, I saw a dad put his hamburger aside and sat down in front of his two little girls that were trying to tell him a story yesterday and he never got to his hamburger he just wrapped it up and stuck it in his pocket because he wanted to intently look into the eyes of his two little baby girls and listen to the story that they were telling and in fact I got so wrapped up in it you know me hey man I got so wrapped up in it I set my hamburger aside so that I could hear the little story coming from those two little girls I, I see changes taking place church family I know tragedies are bad I know they're awful and it's terrible that tragedies have to come to get us to think. It's a bad thing that tragedies have to come to get us to think, to get us to realize what's really important. Let me tell you something. At Christmas time, presents are not what's really important. That's not really what's important. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ and the joy of spending time with your family. How many of you are thankful for that this morning? But unfortunately, there are 
20 families, 26 families in Newtown, Connecticut that won't be spending Christmas with their children or with their wives or with their husbands this year. With that in mind, let's stand this morning as we read from Luke chapter number 18, verses 15 through 17. And then I want to read from Matthew chapter number 18, verses 5 through 7. Jesus loves the little children. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. And the Bible says, And they brought unto him also infants, or little ones, children under three years old, that he would touch them, meaning that he would pray for them and bless them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. I don't know why. I can't even understand that. Verse 16, But Jesus called them unto him, and he said, Suffer little children to come unto me. And he said, Forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of of God, meaning there's a revelation here about the kingdom of God and little children. Verse 17, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God, there it is again, the kingdom of God, meaning the gospel, sonship, his lordship over the earth, the kingdom of God as a little child. What does that mean, Pastor? It means with complete and total and utter trust. How many of you have ever, when you uh, when you've uh, spent time with your kid with your kids, are amazed at the innocence of how much they completely trust? Amen. They know that when they wake up in the morning, they know mom's gonna be there. They know that she's going to be there. They know that if they call out, they know mom or dad's going to show up immediately. It's complete and total and utter trust. He says, and not receive the kingdom of God as a little child with complete and utter total trust shall in no wise enter therein. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Let's read verses 5 through 7. Matthew chapter 18 verses 5 through 7 said these words. And who shall... And whoso shall receive one, such an little child, in my name receiveth me. Verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Can I tell you something this morning, church family? God loves kids. He loves kids kids and if you're in this room and you were once a child guess what believe it or not I know you're growing older but you used to be a kid you used to be a kid some of you are still kids at heart how many kids at heart do I still have in here praise the Lord I was playing with the Christmas lights last night kid at heart he says and if one of these little ones, if you offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone be hanged around his neck. There are some of you that are in this room this morning that I'm talking to you. When you were a kid, daddy abused you. When you were a kid, mama abused you. When you were a kid, an uncle took advantage of you. When you were a little kid, somebody did something to you that was completely and totally and utterly inappropriate. Let me tell you something this morning. Let me let you in on a little secret this morning. God took record of that. He saw that. You say, Pastor, why did he let it happen? Listen, sin was in the world. It was in the world since the time Adam and Eve got here. God may have allowed it to happen. He let it happen. But let me tell you something. He took record of it. He took notice of it. And one day there's a payday coming. And vengeance belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. And one day God will settle the score. What's important for you to know and understand this morning is that Jesus' blood can heal every hurt that you had ever experienced in your life, in your childhood, all the way up until right now. Praise the Lord. And so he says, if you offend one of these little kids, it would be better for you that a millstone be hung around your neck and that you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Verse 7, woe unto the world because of offenses. Meaning what, Pastor? Meaning offenses are happening. And then he gives you the guarantee. For it must needs be that offenses come. I don't like that part, but it's in the Word. I just don't like it. I don't like the fact that it must needs that offenses come. But here's the buffeting of that church family. Though offenses are happening in our world today, we as children of God must take the position of John the Baptist in the prison when Jesus said, Blessed are they that are not offended in me. Blessed are they that are not offended in me. Meaning what? Offenses are coming into the world because the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. And because he's in the world, he's bringing the offense to the body of Christ. He's not bringing the offense to the world. Why? Because judgment is coming to the world. But the offense is coming to the children of God. 
why are they trying to get you offended? Because if he can get you to uh, be offended, he can get you to doubt God. If he can get you offended, he can get you to doubt Jesus Christ's lordship. So listen, if you get offended this next week, you put that under the blood, you forgive that while you stand praying, you give that over to Jesus Christ, and you let that be washed away from your conscience so that you don't have to live in offense and you can stay and keep your mind focused and centered on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Well, there's sermon number one this morning. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Let's pray this morning. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you love little children this morning. God, as we've come and we've read the scriptures this morning, I pray that now, God, you'll make my mouth, Lord, a, a voice, a, a mouthpiece, Lord, in the hearts of men and women in this room, that, Lord, we will sow the word of God into their lives, Lord, and that we will be eternally changed in knowing, Lord, that though offenses must come in this world, Lord, you still love us because we are your children, God, and you love every child that's on this place, Father, and on this, on this earth, and you're taking record of all that's going on, and we give you glory and honor in Jesus. Jesus name amen and amen you can be seated in the presence of the Lord let me ask you something how many of you love kids amen I love kids when I got introduced to kids my kids had already been potty trained amen they had already uh, they had already gone through all uh, of that of the little part of that growing up stage in their life Colin Brook were seven and eight years old when I met Colin Brook and got involved in their lives and let me tell you something that was some awesome times in my house incredible times in my home I remember a football game that we went to and I got baptized by Brooke at that football game I, I remember taking Kyle as a little boy and, and I loved uh, playing with Kyle and swinging him around uh, but what I didn't know is when you, sw when you swing a child around if you let go of them amen if you don't have a, a landing place for where you let go of them they might slide into a wall or, or, or fly up into a windshield somewhere you say pastor you're kind of brutal with your children I love playing with our kids I, I had Kyle and I was throwing him up in the air and we had a real tall house Jim in our house and the fan the ceiling fan was on high I didn't know it would catch his foot Chris and sling him out across the other side of the living room landed on his head laughing he said do it again daddy do it again love it I, when, when they were when they were young seven and eight years old I, I, I showed them a game that grandpa used to play with us and I didn't know that it was abuse but but he used to play this this game with us grandpa would put us in a quilt wrap us up in a quilt tie us up together and he would drag us up and down the stairs and we'd have time so so we took the kids I took them and and she was in there cooking and I threw them down in this quilt and I said this is going to be an awesome game and I wrapped them up in this quilt and I tied them together and I took off running through the hallway and down the stairs I went and Colin heads little their little heads were just bobbing and slapping and they giggled <laughs> I thought they were having fun I love kids I, I, I love spending time with kids I enjoy the, the, the relationship, I, I, I love the trust that are in children. I, I love to look into their eyes and see the trust that's in their heart. A small child is someone who, who can wash their hands without getting the soap wet. Children, are, children their minds are, are, are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. It makes an impression. A child is a person who can't understand why somebody would give away a perfectly good kitten. Why? Because children trust, children love. And my heart is grieved today for the families of Newton, Connecticut. And we want to let you know today, if you're watching this broadcast and, and, and word is going out and there's friends and family in the Connecticut area, uh, that we have people that watch us on Ustream, we want you to know that we are praying for you today. We're praying for the families of Newtown, Connecticut. We're lifting you up. We're asking the blessed Holy Spirit to send comfort to you today and wrap His arms and His wings of love around you and around your family. What range of emotions did you feel when you saw what happened on the news? Did you feel anger? Did you feel distrust? Did you, feel, uh, did you just feel sick in your heart? I, I tell you the way I felt. I felt sick. 
I felt sick at what I see going on in our country, but I had a friend of mine send me a Facebook message this morning with an interesting counter on it. I'd never seen it before. And he talked about the fact that 26 people had died and 20 children had been killed in this horrible tragedy. And he said people were crying out and people are in outrage and people are frustrated and people are upset with this terrible tragedy that's going on. He said, but did you know in the same day, 3,354 babies were aborted in this country? country yesterday while 20 kids were getting killed by a rifle and semi-automatic weapons. I don't know about you church family, but I'm just as much outraged about that as I am about children getting killed in a school somewhere. And I think if there ever was a time that we need to be having some real serious prayer meetings, I think it's now. I think God's speaking to our nation. I think God's trying to wake up our nation. God's trying to get a hold of our nation. He's trying. You say, Pastor, does God use tragedies to get the nation's attention? Yes, but it seems like more tragedies are coming, church family, and less and less people are paying attention to what's going on. They're saying it's sad. They're saying it's bad. They're saying it's terrible when towers fall and thousands of people get killed when towers fall down and churches might have a little bump and a few extra visitors come in in the room but people are not seeking God they're not turning to God it's just like the book of Revelation and the book of Judges mixed together all at the same time the book of Judges says every man did that which was right in his own eyes the book of Revelation says neither did they repent nor turn from their wicked ways church family our hour of deliverance is coming our hour of deliverance deliverance from what pastor deliverance from this world we are about to escape out of this world and go into a glory that everyone deserves to go into, that everyone deserves the right to hear about going into, but there is no other way but through Jesus Christ. He is the only way to get to the Father. Charles Francis Adam, he was a 19th century political figure and he was a diplomat. He kept a diary. One day he entered into his diary. I went fishing with my son today. Then he said these words, it was a day completely wasted. His son, Brock Adams, also kept a diary which is still in existence today. And on that same day, Brock Adams entered into his diary. He made this entry, I went fishing with my father today. It was the most wonderful day of my life. You see, the father thought he was wasting his time while he was fishing with his son. But his son saw it as an investment of time. You see, the only way to tell the difference, church family, between wasting your time and investing your time is to know the ultimate purpose in life for which you spend your time and then judge it accordingly. Mom and dad, are you making investment in the lives of your kids? Mom and dad, are you praying with your children at night? Do your children hear you pray out loud in their ears? Mom and dad, are you teaching your children how to pray? Are you teaching your children how to pray for themselves? Mom and dad, are you reading the Bible and quoting from the Bible to your children? Are you teaching them how to read and understand the Bible for themselves? Many of you know the story that I could not read until I got into 7th grade. I had no way of reading. A 6th grade teacher had caught me copying off of someone else's paper. I did not know how to read. In the sixth grade, I didn't even know how to read the dog cross the road or the cat uh, was out in the street or the chicken, whatever. I, I, I did not know how to read until I got into the seventh grade and a sixth grade teacher caught me and called my mom, was a good friend of my mom and said, hey, listen, this Ayers boy doesn't know how to read. Brennan doesn't know how to read. And so they tested me and they found out that I had dyslexia. If you look at my notes this morning, I have thousands of misspelled words on my notes this morning because when I write out my words, I cross my letters. Every letter on my, on my notes and on my pages are all crisscrossed. When I read the newspaper, it's all crisscrossed. When I read a magazine, it's all crisscrossed. If I read that up there on the screen, I, I, I try my my best to memorize it because it's all crisscross. The, the, the Jesus loves little children. The children's up by where Jesus is supposed to be and the little's up by where love's supposed to be and these out at the end of the sentence I have dyslexia. And so she called and they found out and they put me with a tutor. The tutor began teaching me how to read and I couldn't, I just began memorizing it because whatever the tutor would say, I would memorize it and I would say it back to her to make it sound like I was reading and she said, we're getting nowhere with this kid. He can't read. He can't read. He's ignorant. We can't read. 
And my mom called a good friend of hers that was a teacher named Sister Bynum who was a First Baptist preacher's wife, First Baptist of Sherwood. And she said, I can teach that boy how to read. And they came, met with me over at the Layman Library and sat down with me and she opened up the Bible to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. And when she opened the Bible up to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, I said, hey, they're not moving. They're not moving. She said, what? I said, they're not moving. The, the words... They're not moving around. And she said, read verse number 1. And I began to enunciate and read verse number 1. And church family, I can read the Bible, hallelujah, without the words moving. Every other word moves, but I can read the Word of God this morning. I thank God for people who make an investment in the lives of children. I, I thank God for people who make an investment in their kids. And parents, I just want to ask you this morning, are you making an investment in your children? Are you making an investment in them to listen to them read? Are you making the investment in them to bring them to Junior Bible Quiz on Wednesday nights? Will you say, Pastor, Junior Bible Quiz is hard. They have to work and they have to study. Oh, wow. I thought the Word of God would be worth it to work and study and learn the Word of God. Well, Pastor, they've got school during the week. Let me tell you something. They're not teaching them as much in school as they could learn through the Word of God on a Wednesday night. Hallelujah. I, I, I love school. I'm thankful for school. But parents, our children need to know the Word of God. Amen. They need the, they need the Word brought into their spirit and brought into their hearts. And Jesus loves those kids. Now one of the questions that's going to come out of this and you're going to see me take this message and totally turn this message in a different direction but it's because I want to show you some things in the Word this morning talking about this tragedy and what's going on. One of the questions that's going to result of this tragedy is this. Will the President use, his, use this tragedy to push his radical gun control agenda in the United States? The answer is yes. He will use this to try to bring gun control into the United States and begin to tell people that we need to take our guns away. Let me tell you something, church family. Guns don't kill people. Stupid people kill people with guns. Guns were meant for recreation. Yes, they're meant for recreation and enjoyment and spending time and doing things like that. Guns are also meant for the militia to protect us and to keep us safe. But guns were never meant for us to go out and kill somebody. Amen. If, you know, and, and this is what just absolutely just made me upset. Amen. It, it just made me upset. Why does a man have to prove himself being a man by going in and killing innocent women and children with a, with a bulletproof vest on his chest? If you're a real man, sir, why don't don't you go into a police station and try to shoot up the police station if you're a real man sir let me just call you out this morning why don't you try to go up into an armory and shoot up an armory somewhere why does a man have to prove his manhood by killing kids it's not a man that's a coward did you hear what I said that's not a man that's a coward it's a coward hallelujah and the president will try to do this. Congress will try to do this. And they'll try to take our ammunition away. They'll try to take our guns away. And they're going to continue to push and push and push and push until they completely get their goal of trying to disarm our society. Pastor, what was your response to this? I'm going to give you a revolutionary response that a revolutionary pastor gave to his church family when the revolution began with Great Britain and the tyranny of Great Britain. And here was his response. Buy your kid or your wife a gun for Christmas. Buy your kid or your wife a gun for Christmas. Be responsible. Teach them how to use it. And don't forget to buy plenty of ammunition. You say, Pastor, are you, talking, are you telling us to go out and get guns? Yes. I'm telling you to go and get a gun. Pastor, I don't believe in having guns in my house. Then do what you need to do to protect yourself and your family because we live in a revolutionary time. We're living at a time right now, church family, when civil war could break out in our nation overnight. Overnight, you say between whites and blacks? No, not between whites and blacks. Between ideologies, people who have an who have an ideology, what they want to have an open and a complete free society, and people who want to have a conservative society. And we're in a moment right now, church family, when this is beginning and this tension is beginning to grow into our nation. And we as Christians don't need to be naive. We as Christians need to understand. You say, Pastor, doesn't the Bible say we're supposed to turn the other cheek? On every human face, there's only two cheeks. Once you've turned the second side, church family, you have a responsibility to defend yourself. 
You have a responsibility to protect yourself. You say, well, Pastor, aren't we supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves? Yes, love them. Amen. Love them in Jesus' name. But if they're walking all over you, pick yourself up, push them out of the way in Jesus' name. Protect yourself. Why do we believe as Christians we're supposed to be this passive society that's supposed to be this gentle and loving thing where we let everybody walk all over us and steal everything we have and take everything we have? No, listen, all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Him and God wants you blessed. God wants you to have stuff. God wants you to have a good life. God wants you to have children. And if He gave you all of that and blessed you with all of that, then He means for you to protect it and be a good steward of it in Jesus' name. He wants you to have that. So get the proper license. Do what you need to do. Be responsible. Teach your children. Teach your wife, sir, how to use it. If you want to have a concealed carry, get the right proper concealed carry license. Take the classes. Be a responsible citizen and a proper licensed citizen to protect yourself and your family. What does the Bible say about self-defense? Let me give you a note this morning. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. I'm going to say that again. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. What does the Bible say about self-defense? Let's just take a little journey through the Bible. Can we do that? Exodus chapter 22 and verse number 2. I want to take a little journey uh, through the Bible about self-defense this morning because there's a great concern among the Christian community that we should turn the other cheek. Yes, turn the other cheek. Yes, walk a mile in their shoes. Yes, do what you have to do to be a minister and share the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. But listen, don't be ignorant of the scriptures this morning. Don't be ignorant of the understanding of the scriptures that if God has blessed you with children, let me tell you something. If somebody was picking on my kids, hallelujah, I would smote them like David in the hinder quarters. Come on, somebody. Don't pick on my babies. I'm the only one disciplining my babies. Praise the Lord. But if they're in the schoolhouse, we should support those teachers that are in the schoolhouse that are doing right by our children. I remember one day when my mom and dad, they Miss Green called the school and called the called my mom and dad and said, "Listen, I had to whip him today. He was misbehaving in school today." My mom took off early from lunch, uh, from work, and came over to the schoolhouse and she said, "Miss Green, did you whip my son?" She said, "Yes." And she grabbed me, took me in the bathroom, pulled my pants down, whipped me again. <laughs> Glory to God! Took me back into the classroom, said, "Miss Green, he won't give you no more trouble today." He won't give you any more trouble today. I went home, got home. Daddy was at home. Oh, dear Lord, have mercy. I don't even remember what I did. Dad took me into the bathroom, pulled my pants down. Amen. Whooped me a third time. Come on, somebody. Amen. Set me in my room, and I didn't behave in Miss Green's class. Not no more. Not never again. Why? Because th third time's the charm. Glory to God. Third time's the charm. Let me, give you, let me give you some Bible definitions of self-defense this morning. Let's walk through this together. Just kind of some revolutionary scriptures today that you just need to kind of keep in the background of your mind. Exodus chapter 22 says this, If a thief be found breaking up, meaning what? means if he comes into your house and he be smitten and he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If he be smitten and he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. Meaning what? If somebody's coming into your house to steal your stuff and you gun them down in your house according to the word of God, it's okay. It's okay to protect yourself. It's okay to watch over your stuff and over your family. Verse 3, and it says these words, And if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. Meaning what? Meaning in the middle of the daytime there needs to be an investigation. There needs to be an investigation. They need to find out what's going on. And he should make full restitution. And it's very interesting. The Bible says this about Jewish society in that time. And if he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. He shall be sold for his theft. You say, Pastor, are you going to comment on that? No, other than to say that's what the Bible says. That's just what the Bible says. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 13. You remember this familiar story of Scripture Church families between David and Nabal. Nabal was getting protection from David because Saul was coming after David, coming after his mighty men to kill them and to destroy them and to take them out. And David was providing protection for Nabal and for his sheep herd of 3,000 sheep. 
Now listen, when he was providing protection for him, David expected to be paid for the protection that he had of Nabal and of his sheep. But Nabal turned against David and said, No, I'm not going to pay you for that protection. I'm not going to pay you for watching over my family and watching over my stuff. David gets upset, and here's what he says. Here's the first concealed carry scripture in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 25, verse 13. David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And then girded every man his sword, and David said, Gird upon, girded upon his sword, and there went up David about 400 men. And look what happens. 200 men stayed behind to take care of the stuff. Meaning what? There was a day and a time in David's society, in Jewish society, when revolution was going on, horrible things were taking place in the society and in the countryside. Saul was roving the countryside, killing men and stealing their stuff to prove his kingship and the loyalty that he had as the king of the throne of Israel. David was protecting other people's stuff with his 600 mighty men and he said, hey look, you 200 guys, you stay behind, you protect the stuff. Us 400 guys, we're going to go up, we're going to take Nabal out and his 3,000 and sheep, Abigail comes into the process and says, no, don't do that. I know you protected him, but let me give you this gift. She gives this gift and grace is applied to Nabal's life before David took his life. You'll find these same verses and the same context of those same verses in concealed carry and also the judgment of weapons in your Bible in the book of Romans chapter 12 and the book of Romans chapter 13 meaning what? about the justice and the judge the justice and the judge is given a sword to execute judgment upon the earth why? because the powers that be are ordained of God meaning what pastor? meaning that while we're in this society right now we have to obey the law amen? we should obey the law but unfortunately we have people that are not obeying the law and as we approach the soon and imminent return of Jesus Christ more more lawlessness is going to continue to happen in our nation and all I'm saying is do what you got to do to protect yourself and protect your family. Gird on your sword. Judges chapter 5 verse number 8 talks about when a nation had disarmed itself. When the nation came to a place in Israel's history when they turned after other gods and they disarmed themselves in the time of Deborah and Barak and Sisera and Jael. And the Bible says in verse 8, they chose new gods and then was war in the gates. Meaning when they had chosen these new gods, they disarmed themselves as a nation by putting their trust in these new gods. War came to their nation and when they were in the middle of the war, the Bible says, was there a shield or a spear among 40,000 in Israel? They didn't have a militia. They didn't have anybody armed. They didn't have anybody that could protect the stuff or protect their homes, their families, their wives or the children. And guess what happens? Sisera comes on the scene with the Philistine armies, 900 chariots to come and take them out. Let me tell you something, church family. If an invasion happens in this country, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Do what you can to understand that the Bible says in the last days perilous times will come. Either that's true or that's a lie. Either that's true or that's a lie. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Guys, this is why we need to be holy. This is why we need to have our hearts right with God. Okay? I'm not trying to form a militia this morning. I don't have any strict nine uh, in orange juice sitting at the back of the platform saying they're coming, they're coming, drink it, they're drinking. No, this ain't Jim Jones talking to you this morning. This is Pastor Brennan trying to get your attention to say, hey, look, the Word of God is true. The Word of God gives you license to protect yourself and take care of your family and your stuff and your children. And perilous times are coming in the earth and we need to wake up we need to wake up, we need to be aware, we need to be prayerful, and we need to take care of ourselves. Deborah and Barak, they go out, they prophesy to the children of Israel, 40,000 children of Israel. Sisera is coming with 900 chariots. Nobody's armed, nobody has a weapon, nobody's got a spear, nobody has a sword, nobody has a shield. How did they defeat them? They defeated them by prophecy and by the word of faith that was in their mouth. Literally, God sent rain and the chariot wheels fell off of the chariots and Sisera and his nine 
900 chariots were bogged down in the middle of a mud pool and the children of Israel swept down on them out of the mountains with rocks and clubs. But what's interesting about that story, church family, though God intervened and kept them and protected them, God told them to pick up the weapons and pick up the chariots and carry them home. Why did God tell them to do that? Because God wanted them to have enough common sense to say, hey, when you go home, don't just take the spoil of home of war home with you with clothes and jewels. No, you take those weapons home, you take those chariots home so that the next time the Canaanites come down out of the mountains, you're armed and you're ready and you're prepared. That's what it meant. That's what it meant when it happened. Psalms chapter 144 says these words, Blessed be the Lord. My strength which teaches my hands how to war. My fingers how to fight. What does that mean, Pastor? It means when necessary, when necessary, protect yourself. When it's necessary, protect yourself. Let me tell you something. Times get hard in this country. I know I'm your pastor and I'm full of compassion and I'm full of love. But you come stealing gas out of my car at 9 o'clock at night at my house. You come breaking into my chicken house in my yard. Church family, preachers love chicken, by the way. Praise the Lord. Okay? Me and Smith and Wesson, we're going to meet you out in the yard, okay? I love y'all. I love y'all. I love the United States. But the Bible says perilous times shall come in the last days. I know it's Christmas, and I know I brought two hard messages this past Christmas to you to bring to you but let me tell you something when we got chemical weapons being loaded and put it on the planes in the middle of Syria right now and we got Hezbollah trying to take over the chem chemical weapons depots in the middle of Syria right now I, I want you to have a Merry Christmas but I want you to have a mind that is aware of what's going on around you because Jesus is about to come and if he tarries it's going to get weird around here it's going to get crazy around here and you have to have your faith and your trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let me give you another scripture about the case for self-defense. It says these words in the book of Nehemiah chapter number 4. Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls. Ezra is bringing uh, groups of men over to help rebuild the walls of, of Jerusalem after King Cyrus had given the decree for the children of Israel to go back home. Sanballat and Tobiah are upset and they're mad because the children of Israel are rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And the Bible says in the book of Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 16 through 18, And it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants which wrought in the ark and the other half held both a spear and shield and bows and habergoans and the rulers behind all of the house were of Judah. They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one of us with one of his hands wrought in the work, while the other hand held on to a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded about his side, and so builded, and he sounded the trumpet was with me. What was he saying? I'm saying they were concealing, and they were working at the same time. They were concealing and they were working. They were taking care of their homes, their family, their wives, and their children. And they understood that they lived in perilous times. They lived in a time when they needed to protect themselves and protect their families. You say, Pastor, you've given us a lot of Old Testament scriptures. Okay, let's go to the New Testament. Luke chapter 22 says these words, verse 35 and 36. Luke 22, verse 35 and 36, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's about to be taken out of the way, taken up into a cloud, into heaven. And Jesus testifies to his disciples. And he says in verse 35, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, did you lack anything? Did you lack anything? And the disciples looked at Jesus and they said, No, Jesus, we didn't lack anything. Meaning when Jesus sent out the twelve, he sent them out without a purse, without script. He sent them without shoes. All they had was their staff in their hand and the word of God in their hearts. A witness of the testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, whatever city that you go into, bid yourself in that city. If they welcome you, then go and testify to them of me. If they don't welcome you, shake the dust off of your feet. He empowered them. He said, I'll give you the power to tread upon serpents, scorpions, upon every power of the enemy. I'm going to give you this power he sends out the 70 and this is the way that he sends them out but now Jesus is leaving and he's going to the right hand of the father the majesty on high and Jesus says in the very next verse he says hey look guys then he said unto them but now meaning what meaning I'm about to go 
I was here with you in person on this earth where I could protect you and where I could keep you. But now I'm going to be in faith within your heart through my shed blood. But me in physical form, I'm about to go to the Father in heaven. So here's what I want you to do. He said, do you have a purse? Let him take it with him. Meaning what? It takes money to do ministry now. Takes money to do ministry now. He says, and likewise script. What is that? A plan. The word of God. And let him take it with him. And he says, if you don't have a sword, let him sell his garment and go buy one. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, I'm going to leave you as sheep among wolves. I'm going to leave you in a society that continually is going to get perilous and it's going to get worse until the day that I come back, do the ministry, use the purse, use the script, and if you have to, Protect yourself. Okay? I promise I'm not going to whip my gun out on you this morning, okay? Even though it would make for an awesome altar call. Hallelujah. <laughs> Love you, buddy. <laughs> By the way, that sound effect of Medea's AK-47 going off, just delete that, okay? Just delete that this morning. What are you saying, Pastor? What are you trying to tell us Christmas time? Jesus loves the little children and I need to buy a gun? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I think what I'm really trying to say is, is it's okay to defend yourself. The world's getting worse. And uh, I think the over and over and over and over again, hearing in a pulpit, well, pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. Pray for them, pray for them, please pray for them. You know, one of these days it's going to be us. And let me tell you something. If it's us, if it's West Plains, okay, if it's us, it's just not going to feel real good to hear the rest of the world say on television, well, we're praying for y'all. We're praying for y'all. We're praying for y'all. Pastor, isn't that encouraging? You know what would be more encouraging? If some smart Christians, if some smart Christians used some common sense and said, you know what, when it comes to our neck of the woods, we're going to take care of our own. Wouldn't that be awesome if on the news, huh, somebody walked up into a church in West Plains and they didn't get in the door because they was down in the lobby trying to get in the door. Wouldn't it be awesome if in West Plains, in a schoolhouse in our area or in a church house in our area where our little babies are back there worshiping and you know, you know as well as I do, one of these days, one of them idiots is going to go into a church and start gunning down people. They've been to shopping malls, they've been to schools, they've been to theaters. Guess where they're coming next? Guess where they're coming next? Wouldn't it be interesting if it had the testimony that while we were in the middle of service, amen, and some idiot came in the door, demon-possessed, trying to take the pastor out and take the church out, the church security team tackled him out in the lobby and hauled him off before he ever got in the door. Because some people just had some common sense. And you say, Pastor, don't you know, Pastor, that everybody that lives by the sword dies by the sword? You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. But the scriptures do condone, do condone to you and let you know that it's okay to defend yourself, to take care of yourself if you use the sword in the proper context. And so if I have gun owners in the room, I just want to let you know it's biblical and it's okay. Now if I've got folks in the room and you're not a gun owner, God bless you. Those of us that have guns, we'll take care of y'all. Amen. We'll look out for y'all. What else are you trying to say, Pastor? Here's what else I'm trying to say. Psalms chapter 20 and verse number 7 says this. Some trust in their chariots and in their horses. They trust in those things. Some people trust in concealing a weapon in their lap. But let me tell you something. A Christian with a concealed weapon in their lap better understand the balance what is the balance, the intricate balance of having a gun strapped to your leg or your arm or inside your coat pocket somewhere and you're a Christian? The intricate balance is this. Some trust in those things. They trust in chariots and they trust in horses. But we as children of God are allowed to defend ourselves, but our trust is in not what defends us. Our trust is in the name 
of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's in the name of the Lord. Because if the day ever comes that all ammunition is gone and we can't go get ammunition anymore, and we can't defend our wives and our homes and our children except with our bare hands and rocks like the children of Israel did in the book of Judges, I don't know about you, but some of us are going to have to really trust in the name of the Lord. That's what it's about anyway, Chuck. Trusting in the name of the Lord, Jen. Trusting in Him with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. And I don't know about you, but I'm trusting Jesus to do some things in this church this next year that would boggle your mind. I'm trusting Jesus to take this church and flip it up on its head one more time and change this place and turn this place into a place where people can learn the Word of God, not just hear it, but actually hear it and do it. I'm trusting the Lord that this is going to be a year and in this coming year when people at Victory Family Worship Center get smart and they take care of their families and their children and they do what they can to provide and put back what they need to put back for the perilous times that are coming but at the same time their mouth is opening and they're witnessing and they're sharing the love of Jesus with their friends in this community and they're getting them in church and getting them prayed through and getting them saved and getting them on their way to heaven amen because if Jesus tarries yes sin's going to abound in the world but the promise is where sin does abound grace does much more abound and I say God bring it on hallelujah bring it on God let your grace abound in Victory Family Worship Center like never before stand with me all across this place every head bowed and every eye closed let me ask you one question are you putting your trust in the name of the Lord are you putting your trust in the name of the Lord are you putting your trust in in the name of the Lord. Maybe there's somebody that's out here this morning and you're in this audience with your head bowed and your eyes closed, everybody being reverent, nobody moving around. Let me ask you one simple question. You say, Pastor, I've been trusting in money. I've been trusting in things. I've trusted in my chariots and I've trusted in my horses. And I've lived my life my own way. I've done things my own way. I made my own choices. I made my own decisions. And I've been trusting in those things, but I've found, Pastor, it's made me miserable. It's made me miserable. Because the more I trust in my stuff, the less satisfied in my spirit, my heart, I feel. The reason is, is because stuff, stuff will never fill the void that's in your soul, sir. Even having a gun in your hand won't make you as secure as knowing you have Jesus in your heart. If there's somebody that's in this room this morning, you say, Pastor, I don't have Jesus in my heart. He's not living down inside of me. I've trusted in stuff. I've trusted in things. But I want Jesus to live inside of my heart this morning. I want to make Him Lord over my life. That's, that's for every person in this room that maybe even feels backslid. From God, you say, Pastor, I need to make Him Lord this morning. I need to put my trust in Him. If that's you, if you know that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up in the air and say, Pastor, I've been trusting in things, I've been trusting in stuff, but I want to put my trust in the name of the Lord. I want to put my trust in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 One man lifted his hand. Anybody else? Pastor, I need to put my trust in the name of the Lord. Let me talk to another group of people this morning. Okay? And I'm not down on you. I'm not getting on to you. I'm preaching this way to you to get you to, to just open your eyes to see what's going on in the world around you. And if you, if you say this morning, you say, Pastor, I've been a little apathetic. I've been a little passive as a Christian. Well, God will just take care of me. 
I don't need to be proactive about taking care of myself. God will just provide. He'll, he'll just take care of me. I, I don't need to have a plan. I don't, I don't, I don't need, to, need to have a set of priorities. The Holy Spirit will just take care of me. He'll, he'll just guide me wherever I need to go and get for me whatever I need to get. Let me tell you something. If God was just going to take care of you, if the Holy Spirit was just going to meet all of your needs, you wouldn't have to have a brain. You would not have to have a brain. But God gave you a brain this morning so that your brain and your conscience and your mind could listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, listen to the voice of Jesus, listen to His Word and get a plan together and get prepared to take care of your homes and your families and your children. If you're in this room this morning and you say, Pastor, I've just been a little lackadaisical. I've just been a little lazy. I've just been kind of just meandering through life. And I see what's going on in this world, but I'm just, I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared for what's going to happen in the perilous times in America. And I'm not prepared what's going to happen if Jesus tarries. If that's you, and you want God to just begin to give you an action plan to get ready, to just get prepared for what's going on in this nation and what's happening in our world, would you lift your hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need a plan. I need a plan. I need a plan. I need a plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Let's pray. Those of you that lifted your hand and you say, Pastor, I'm going to put my trust in the name of the Lord. While I pray this morning, I want you to pray along with me, but I, I want you to pray your own prayer. I want you to ask the Lord this morning to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you, to wash your heart, and then I want you to just put your trust in Him and declare and say that you're going to follow Him all the rest of the days of your life this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these that lifted their hands this morning. And I pray for this church family. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord, that Jesus does love the little children. And I thank you, Lord, that you've taught us as Christian parents. You've taught us as Christian adults, Father, how to behave ourselves and take care of ourselves, how to provide for ourselves and provide for our families, God. And, Father, you're telling us to wise up. You're telling us, Father, to get smart about what's happening in this world and what's going on around us in this world. And Father, while this message is challenging to us, Lord, because we have always trusted and believed and known that, that, that Father, the trumpet's going to sound and we're going to escape and we're going to get out, Lord. Lord, we're not guaranteed what's going to happen between now and the moment the trumpet sounds. And, and so, Father, give us intelligence. Give us knowledge. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding of the times, Lord around us, that we may protect our children, that we may protect our homes, that we may protect our families, God, that we may protect our stuff. And Father, help us, Father, to prepare ourselves so that when the perilous times begin to come, Lord, we will not be running around with a head, Lord, like a chicken with our head cut off, but Father, we will have peace, we will have assurance, we will know, Lord, that you're taking care of us, and we will be well prepared to minister to those people, Lord, that were under prepared and I thank you Father I give you the glory I give you the honor and those that are putting their trust in you let them put their trust in you like never before in Jesus name amen and amen look at me just for a moment